Hey guys, it's Brandon. I wanted to do the third game in our Master Game series. And this one is uh, one of the most famous games of all time and one of the most instructional games of all time. It's played in 1985. It's Anatoly Karpov versus Gary Kasparov. And uh, one of the things that this game illustrates is the relative, sort of the relative power of pieces. And uh, I'd like to start this by posing a question. Which piece is more powerful? Rook or the knight? Well, all else being equal, the rook is of course more powerful. It can move farther, it's more flexible, it's more covers more squares, more mobile, the knight sort of sort of has this awkward movement that we know it's a short range piece. Um, the rook is generally a more powerful piece than the knight. But there are certain circumstances, and in this game is one of the most instructive instructive examples of all time of that, where a knight can be more powerful than even two rooks. So let's see what happened in the game. Karpov playing white played e4, c5 the Sicilian, knight f3, e6, d4 the open Sicilian, c takes, knight takes. Um, this is a time on variation, I don't know much about it so I won't comment really on it, but the first interesting point I think comes here, c4. So with the pawns on e4 and c4, uh, Karpov sets up the Maroxi bind, which is aimed at uh, preventing this black pawn move, uh, d5, from coming in, sort of freeing his position, uh, sort of clamping down on this d5 square in other ways. Um, knight f6 from Kasparov, knight c3, a6, of course kicking this knight, knight comes back to a3, d5. Okay, so I just got done saying black is, white is trying to prevent this move d5 with the uh, pawns in the Maroxi bind here. So, Kasparov just says, okay, he's going to go ahead and play this anyway. So, after all these uh, captures here, White is left with this uh, pass pawn here. Uh, it's an extra pawn, it's a pass pawn, and uh, moment protected enough times. So, it's a gambit. Uh, essentially, Kasparov played this gambit. And because of this game, and maybe some others, I'm not sure, but mostly because of this game, uh, this, this move here, d5, uh, here, d5 is known as the Kasparov gambit. So what's the idea of the gambit? It's to get active piece play, some kind of compensation for it. So, knight b4. Okay, bishop b2, it's in development, bishop c5, castles, castles, bishop f3, protecting this pawn, bishop f5. Now this is an important bishop, and we'll see why in a second. Okay, bishop g5, pinning this knight. Now an important move in the game, rook to e8. And uh, this is important because we need to hold on to this light square bishop. And uh, if he were to make a throwaway move here, Kasparov says something like king to h8, then bishop to e4, and uh, since this knight is pinned to the queen, bishop takes e4, knight takes, uh, you know, hitting this bishop, forcing something like bishop e7, and there's really no, no anything going on for, for black in this position. He's just sort of down a pawn. So, rook e8 is designed stopping this bishop to e4 move. Oops. So, queen to d2, freeing the d1 square, trying to add another defender to this pawn here. b5, cutting the knight out from c4. This is an important move. This knight is on the rim. It would like to get out and do something more active, but right now it's cut from going anywhere except to d1. So, rook to d1, just sort of piling up protection on this pawn. We've got a knight, a queen, rook, bishop all protecting this pawn here. So, uh, what comes next? Knight d3. This is the key move in the game here. This knight sitting here on d3 and protected by this bishop on uh, f4 is really the linchpin, the key to this whole idea in this gambit that, uh, that Kasparov's played. And the reason for that is it's cutting off, first of all, oops, first of all, it's cutting off the queen and the rook on the d-file. But more importantly, is covering the e1 and c1 squares and preventing white's rooks from getting there, which is where the rooks need to be in order to do anything active. And that's sort of the point we get to when we're discussing which piece is more powerful. Rooks are powerful when they have open files and ranks to work with. When they don't, they're sort of just defensive pieces. The rook here on f1, for example, is doing nothing but watching the f2 square and his brother here on d1. And same thing you could say for this d rook. It's can't go down the D file, and it can't go to either of these two squares. So that's sort of the reason why, uh, 
in this position, the knight is even more powerful than maybe you could even argue both of these rooks. So, after knight d3, knight to b1, h6, putting a question to the bishop, bishop h4, b4, an important move, forcing this knight away to a4, but also cutting off the, b, uh, the, b, the knight on b1 from going to any of these two squares to do something more active. So only square right now would be d2, although it's currently covered by the queen. So this bishop is attacked, just bishop d6, blockading this pawn, stopping it from going anywhere at the moment, getting out of the way, and further cutting off this knight from going anywhere. Of course, it's now can't go here uh, because, well, the knight and the bishop are covering that square, and it can't go here because of the queen covering that square. So these two knights here are effectively cut off from the game. Important. Bishop g3. Okay, probably hoping to remove this blockade at some point, or trade off. Uh, getting off of this h4 square, where it's unprotected and could be a tactical target. Rook to c8. So now, Kasparov's rooks are blaring down these open files, beautiful open files for the rook. And uh, there's nothing that can be done, uh, because these rooks, of course, can't get there to challenge it, because of this beautiful knight. Same here. So, b3. Now, Karpov has is, got the idea of playing knight b2, challenging this knight, and the pride and joy for the position will be lost. So, uh, there's a great video on YouTube where Kasparov, uh, and I'm going to put a link to this in the description, where Kasparov is talking about this game with another grandmaster, and he says, I played, I fought a long time to try to stay, keep my knight, and I played the move g5. The idea is, of course, after knight b2 now, knight takes b2, queen takes b2, g4, drops the bishop. Bishop, uh, because, of course, the bishop takes, then bishop takes bishop, but if bishop e2, rook c2, forking the queen and the bishop. So, with uh, this move, uh, g5, it's preventing knight b2, so bishop exchange comes in, now g3. Now, the renewed threat is this knight to uh, b2 uh, move, because now instead of having nowhere to go, the bishop can tuck itself back on either g1 or g2 or h1. So, Sparov says I needed another move to keep this knight, knight to d7. So now the idea is, uh, if knight to b2 comes in, knight to e5, and then if the exchange comes in, well, he's just recharged his knight here on the d3 square. Um, so, after knight d7, bishop g2. I think the important thing, the bishop g2 is just to get itself covered and protect the f3 square, which is, of course, a royal fork square. So, like, if a knight landed here, then... Uh, it could be dangerous. It could be, a, it could be a fourth. So, like, knight e5 would threaten that move anyway. So, bishop g2, queen f6, a3, a5, a takes b4, a takes b4, queen to a2. And at this point in the video, it's amusing, because Kasparov is clearly proud of this game, is sort of laughing and saying, you know, here's world champion Karpov that moves 25, 26, 27, who has nothing constructive to do. He's got no moves. It's almost like he's in Zugvang. This knight can't go anywhere. This knight can't go anywhere. The, the rooks are blocked from getting onto their best squares. The queen sort of can't go anywhere. This bishop is even sort of blocked in here. He's got nothing to do. And at this point, he sort of played these moves over here, and uh, maybe hoping for something on the A-file, but Karpov, uh, Kasparov says, okay, bishop g6, make a move, make another one, d6. That's what Karpov came up with, and Kasparov was laughing in the video and said again, okay, g4, make another move. I dare you to find something active to do. Queen to d2. Okay, king g7, make another move. f3, now something happens. I think the idea here is that uh, he wants to, Karpov wants to open the f-file for his rooks, so we see queen takes d6. Now he's got his, even got his gambit pawn back, and including having this much better position. f takes g4. Opening up the f file, maybe he can find some play there. But queen takes d4, check king to h1, knight f6, and black's pieces are just coming in the knight's camp, as Kasparov would say. And uh, and this position, the move, believe it or not, that Karpov made, and it was actually the best move in the position. Queen takes d3, sacrificing the queen after knight check, rook takes, bishop d3, 
rook d2, pinning, <laughs> pinning this bishop. The end result of all this uh, bloodbath is that uh, Karpov has three minor pieces for the queen when he made that trade. Okay, three minor pieces, three points each, nine, queen roughly worth nine. You'd think that's an even trade. But the fact that these rooks and this queen and the king, oh, the white king is just so exposed makes it so that the game is essentially over within a few moves. Rook c1. It's a brilliant tactical combination, actually. Um, you know, if rook takes, then queen takes rook, and etc. But knight b2 is what was played. And uh, you know, rook takes e3 here isn't really possible, actually. Uh, I, should I should note after rook takes c1, rook takes e3 isn't really possible because of rook takes d1 check, bishop f1, rook takes e3, and you know, king g2, rook takes b3. This knight is still trapped and will be shortly executed. This knight's got nowhere to go, so he'll just be down two exchanges with a knight on the rim and having to stare at this pass pawn coming down the board. So that's what would have happened if rook takes queen. The way he Karpov played it isn't much better because he gets mated, but it was hopeless for him at this point anyway. Knight to b2, queen f2, knight to d1, and rook d1 check, and Karpov's resigned. The reason being that uh, there's no way to stop the mate after, you know, like something like this. Uh, check, only move, take, check, is mate. King's got nowhere to go. So, But actually, the funny thing of this game is that. Uh, Kasparov missed a mate in two. He found a mate in four, but he missed a mate in two. Uh, after knight d2 here, this is uh, faster. Rook to d1, or rook to e2. Uh, just no way to prevent the queen and rook from coming in here and mating. So, a really instructive game. And we'll just spend one more minute here taking a look at the final position. Or not the final position, but the, sort of the important position. Um, we see here just. The thing that he got, the important thing to note is that out of this gambit, he got this active peace play with this knight and his bishop protecting this knight, cutting off the rook and from going anywhere. You, you can see that this, uh, and this game is famous for being known as the octopus game, this octopus knight reaching into all these squares like an eye of a giant octopus. I think Raymond Keane was the one who said that. So, uh, I hope. You guys, I've sort of persuaded you that there are times when a knight can be more powerful than a rook, or even two rooks in this case. And I hope you guys enjoyed that game, and we'll see you next time.